Uh, let me uh, welcome members to the second meeting in 2014 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, can I just remind members to turn off mobile phones and indeed uh, uh, the panel members and members of the public as well. Um, the Parliament's uh, photographer uh, may be taking some shots of the committee uh, during uh, the inquiry process. If you have any concerns about that, anyone who is present, uh, would you let uh, our officials know about that? Uh, we have received uh, apologies today from uh, Margaret McDougall, uh, MSP, so I sit in solitary splendour at the top of the table here today. Agenda item one is for the committee to decide whether to take item four in private, uh, which is on the provision of services to cross-party groups. It's, uh, is the committee agreed? Agreed. Agenda item two is for the committee to decide whether its consideration of its inquiry into EU rules and the draft report on EU rules should be taken in private at future meetings. Committee agreed? Thank you. Agenda item three is uh, an inquiry into uh, lobbying. I'd like to welcome our first panel today, Sarah Collier, from, who's Policy Officer of Children in Scotland, John Downey, who's the Director of Public Affairs for the Scottish Council for Voluntary Organisations, Dave Moxham, who's the Deputy General Secretary of the Scottish Trade Unions Congress, and Jenny Kemp, the Coordinator for Zero Tolerance. Uh, it's my intention uh, not to have opening statements, but to go straight to questions. Uh, if time permits, at the end, I'll invite panel members to summarise and draw our attention to any points we've not covered in question. So I think that's, that's an approach that worked uh, last week and hopefully will work this way. I also recognise the presence of Neil Finlay uh, here today, who, if he, if he wishes, uh, will join in the questioning after uh, members of the committee have had uh, their opportunity on each topic uh, so to do. Right, first question, Cara Hilton. Right, I'll just kick off. Um, obviously, there's not been any major lobbying scandals in Holyrood um, to date. Um, so what ex to what extent do you think reform is required or not? You guys um, choose. Question to all the panel members, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> John, uh, you're looking... I'm happy to start, happy to start, Camina. Uh, I, I, I don't think, I mean, Holyrood has a totally different ethos, culture in terms of uh, the politics in Scotland and the way that you know, the, the system operates. I mean, I think from our point of view, we don't think there's been any major problems. And I, you know, and I think and when this was first put as a private member's bill, I think it, you know, it, it did acknowledge that there wasn't a problem that we we're trying to solve here. So and that's one reason why we don't think the bill is necessary. But obviously, the key issues are around you know, we need a participatory approach to development of policy and legislation, and actually, which is a fundamental part of a healthy democracy. And actually, democracy in Scotland, you know, you know, has issues. You know, it's because if you look at so this last election in the Scottish Parliament, 50% of 50.4% 50 of people voted, 37% in local government. The last three local government elections uh, have by elections have been 20%. 18, 17 and then 18.5 last week. So we have a real issue around democracy and access, some of the principles that this parliament was founded on. And for us, I think, yep, you know, the third sector has a strong access and a strong voice in the parliament. You can actually probably see we've been probably the most successful lobbyists over the past 14 years in terms of climate change and minimum price for alcohol and the smoking ban. But that's because we've built trust, we've built relationships and I think you know there has been a lot of transparency there, so I don't see that there is you know a, an issue that needs a register, or we don't see. Sorry. Um, I uh, was involved recently in an issue where the, the Parliament was caught in the hop. Um, the Zero Tolerance campaign was one of the organisations that was very concerned about the continued presence in the Parliament of Bill Walker, MSP, who's now uh, left us, and. I think that was an issue where, where people hadn't anticipated something happening. Suddenly there was a huge scandal, there was a huge outcry, and the Parliament was really caught in the hop and had to act very quickly to try and mitigate a really unpleasant situation. And, and I think it's, it's important to, 
to look ahead, you know, to see could we anticipate any kind of lobbying scandal, could we anticipate any kind of problem and actually head it off at the pass. And that's that's what our position probably as an organisation is that um, something preventative would be better than waiting for some sort of scandal to happen and then there to be all the, 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 the problems and the fallout associated with that. That said, I, I agree with a lot of what John's said about um, you know, the, the founding principles of the Parliament being about equality, you know, equality of access and opportunity, this being a very uh, participative uh, place where, where policy making is open to, to the Scottish populace and that's a good thing and a strong thing. But um, I think we may be uh, kidding ourselves if we think that the Parliament is, is fully open and, and accessible and transparent. I think it's open and transparent to, to those and such as those who, who live in this world and who operate in this world and who understand the Parliament and who who are you know, popping in and out of it every day and who are happy to have chats with members about a whole range of issues. There's a whole lot of people outside this building who will never come near here and who really still find it quite myst mystical. And I think if we um, can do more to capture the kind of activity that happens here, and our principal concern is that the, the, the activity that happens here on behalf of vested interests and commercial bodies, um, I think that would, would help with the kind of issues that John raised about voter turnout, for example, because people would be a lot less cynical about uh, the Parliament and really would believe that it was here to, to make the best possible public policy. Is it a supplementary on specifically what Jenny said, Cameron? Yeah. Right, sorry. Just say, how would the Bill Walker scandal with respect to influence lobbying? I don't see that as anything to do with the lobbying. No, it's not related to lobbying as such. It's just a, an example of a time when the Parliament was, was caught on the hop with something which didn't have good rules and procedure for. It wasn't able to respond quickly because it hadn't been anticipated. So it's just to draw a parallel, really, in terms of the Parliament being ahead of, of issues. Um, okay. um, yeah, I, mean, I would tend to concur um, fairly strongly, actually, with what with what Jenny was saying. I mean, I think the answer to the first question, is there a problem? And I think it's fair to preface that by saying, you know, this is a parliament which was created in a, in a modern and, and uh, you know, an open way. Is, is there a problem? The answer to that question is we don't know. And one of the answers to that question is because we may not have the systems in place that would identify. Is there potentially a problem? Yes, of course there is, because this parliament takes decisions which are um, of enormous significance, both financial um, and strategic. And there are organisations, including my own, that seek to influence those decisions. So it seems to me a fairly straightforward um, supposition that um, those two factors, in combination with the public perception factor which Jenny talked about, which is that whether we like it or not, a large proportion of the general public aren't as trusting of what goes on in this building as perhaps they could and should be. Um, Adding to, adding to that, it seems to me that it's entirely sensible to try and design um, a mandatory scheme for, res um, for registration which makes those affairs more open, more public and more accountable. Yeah, if I could just give an example as well of, uh, that maybe suggests the possible need for regulation. It was something that uh, happened, I think, about the start of last year, and it was just a small uh, Sunday newspaper story, but it picked up um, an issue around the cross-party groups in the Parliament. Um, I'm the Secretariat for one of those. Um, and it was just a story that you know suggested that there might be something there um, that, that uh, groups were, had not submitted their annual returns, and there was a question of... You know who was providing the secretariat for what benefit? What were they getting out of it? And I have to say, this committee acted fairly quickly on that. There was um, either a re revision to the code of conduct for the cross-party groups. Um, all the secretariat came in to get a bit of training on that to make sure that we, we, we were doing everything properly and, and above board. So. Um, it wasn't a real issue, but it suggests perhaps that people are looking for looking for things like that. So, um, with that in mind, um, we're not really aware of any problems. But that's not to say something could come up. And um, so, you know, we're perfectly happy to to be open and transparent in whichever way possible. Just a follow up, just for John, if I may. Um, obviously, SCVO represents um, 1,500 organisations. Can you say with confidence that your position here? represents the views of your member organisations and, you know... I think, you know, organisations like, you know, uh, SCPO, the STUC, any trade union as well, I mean, you, you don't, you can't represent the view of every individual member. We have members who disagree with our position. Some are in favour of a register. Some, you know, think, for example, that it's potentially good, but it's only for commercial lobbyists and uh, charities should be exempt. 
But actually, we, we've got a fairly strong policy process that we go through in terms of with our board, with our policy committee of 32 people who represent the sector. We, we hold extensive roundtables and consultations. So I think, you know, uh, I'm very... Uh, conscious that we need to be seen to have that policy process and that's actually part of our you know, USP in a sense when, when we represent views to MSPs and government that actually we take a sector point of view and, and all of that and actually that's where you know, we place it so certainly I'm confident that this is the views of the majority of our members but yes certainly there's some that disagree but that's, you know, that's healthy, that's not uh, Neil Finlay on this specific? Yeah. No, just on that point, um, in terms of how SCVO came about their position in relation to the consultation that I carried out, um, was that considered by the policy committee of SCVO? Yeah. I mean, our, our policy committee sees all our draft uh, consultation papers, you know, and we see they see that they're open to come to meetings to discuss it because actually we invite them to all round tables we have, whether that's on long-term funding, procurement, and actually, you know, the private members. But I would have to look back exactly to see what our process is. Well, but that is our, our normal procedure. And actually, the, the response from our members was actually that those politicians have the responsibility of public uh, public office, and actually it's their duty to be open and transparent. Why place that on the third sector? spoken to members of the policy uh, committee of SCVO who say the first time any of this was discussed was December. Therefore, um, I think Mr Downey may wish to check uh, and, and, and clarify to the committee whether SCVO, um, in criticising some of the democratic processes within this parliament, is actually a, a democratic organisation itself, because if it did not go through the policy to come in... No, just a, 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 a convener, if you if just, you may, if may. Just a wee second. What it, just procedurally, I think, if you're inviting uh, SCBO to review their processes, I think I would be entirely happy to receive advice at a later date when you're clear you have done so, unless you want oh, to put on the record right now. In, in response, uh, Neil may remember, in response to his... Uh, uh, oh, yeah. oh, thanks. Uh, sh 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 uh, private members bill 15 of our major members actually signed up to our response because we actually we get phone calls from a lot of members who were working on a very heavy policy workload in terms of responding to Scottish Government, responding to Scottish Parliament committees, who actually said, what were SCVO doing about this? And actually, they signed up to our response, and you'll remember, Neil, there was at least 15. So actually, we spoke extensively to our members before we responded to you. 15 signed up to support it in the principle, because actually, they didn't have time to do it themselves, and they were happy with our response to your. So we did talk to people. A follow up in that, can uh, you? I'd like to move on to other uh, subjects, so. if I may, because I've given SCBO the opportunity, if they require, to look at the matter further to revert to the committee, and I'd prefer, if I may, to deal it with it, deal it with that way. But as we go through the questioning, I'm quite prepared, if necessary, to come back to it. Cara Hilton. Uh, um, Mr. Brown has already answered this question, but if I can ask the other panel members, um, the Code of Conduct, Conduct for MSPs places responsibilities on members and they're dealing with lobbyists. Should responsibility for registering lie with those being lobbied or the lobbyists or both? <coughs> From the SGC's point of view, we, we obviously, obviously support clear regulation and clarity in relation to the conduct of MSPs. That goes beyond doubt. I always find these things difficult because one works on a presumption, either organisationally or, or, or in relation to the representatives, that, you know... That, that you're not, all, you know, that you're not already um, conducting yourself with absolute probity. So, if, if, if it sounds as if that's the case, it's because I'm, I'm dealing with a with, with a hypothesis. Um, I don't think that that's enough, and the reason that I don't think it's enough is because, or and I will come back to organisations like myself, because organisations like myself have um, a large range policy intervention. Um, many of those policy interventions have potential economic consequences. Um, I'm not sure that the detailing, for instance, of a meeting with us by an MSP, for instance, would go um, sufficiently far to explain our process and our attempt to engage and influence the Parliament, which we regularly do. Um, I believe that my organisation should, um, should, be, um, uh, should be open to that level of scrutiny and thus um, uh, should be registering as, a, uh, as an interest. I hate the word lobbying, but you know what I mean. <laughs> 
Can, mm. can I just mm. follow up with a wee supplementary? Clearly, MSPs are bound by a code of conduct, which they must obey. Um, but in the lobbying industry, essentially the codes are voluntary. Is it your position that there should be a symmetry in, in that both the lobby lobbied and the lobbyer uh, should have some formal framework that governs their activities? Y yes, and that both should be mandatory. Okay. I think we have to be aware of the wide range of individuals with whom organisations who have an interest in public policy would want to be in contact, so we would have to take account of the fact that not all of, all of our contact would be with MSPs, it might be with civil servants, it might be with MSP staff, it might be with special advisors, a whole range of people. Um, so I, I think you know we need more transparency about what MSPs' diaries look like, for example, who they're meeting with, what they're doing. But um, I think the, the, the bulk of the, the kind of scrutiny should be on who's, who's seeking to have um, access to public officials and, and why. I'm in agreement with what Dave and Jenny have just said. Um, I gave the example of the cross-party group, and again, I'd return to that. That's, that's very helpful guidance for me when I'm doing the annual return, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So something along those lines that would help me in my kind of lobbying behaviour as a policy officer would definitely be useful. Okay, let me move on to Cameron, who wants to uh, discuss the register. How would, first of all, yes, to what extent do you think the register will address any of these problems that you're talking about? I'm not sure about that. And also, how do you think the word lobbyist, which I think what you covered, should be defined? So it's two questions. I mean, I, I think the word lobbyist is very, very difficult. Um, an analogy would be with, the, um, uh, with tax avoidance. Um, if you speak to any tax professional, they'll tell you that there's reasonable tax avoidance and non-reasonable tax avoidance, but as far as anyone's concerned just now, tax avoidance is a bad thing. And as far as a lot of people are concerned, lobbying is a bad thing. I don't believe that's the case, but I do believe that we, we're dealing with a word which has become somewhat pejorative, and that is a difficulty, and I won't, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I can easily get round that for you, but you know, as far as possible, I think we have to look beneath the semantics and say, um, should it be the case that an organisation um, which expends resources on um, attempting to influence policy should make that, should make that clear? Um, and the answer to that is yes. Should that affect um, uh, organisations whose prime purpose is to lobby? The answer is yes. Um, should that affect organisations who do that in-house for commercial purposes? The answer, it seems to me, and this is where I'm pretending to how the register would work, the answer to that would have to be yes. Should it pertain to organisations of a certain size who spend money but don't make a profit? My answer to that question would be yes, which would be the first three questions I think I'd be asking on any register of, um, uh, of, of lobbying. How do you define lobbyists? Though? That's what I was trying to get. Is there a definition that you could put for lobbyists? That's the, the, the key point. There. My, my definition would be um, uh, uh, the attempt to influence policy by relationship with government and, uh, and MSPs through um, a, a range of different communication devices. Can I ask what the others think? I think that's quite a good definition, actually, Dave. Um, I guess our, our main concern is where lobbying starts and information sharing ends and the kind of blurry lines between them. If one of you asks me for information about something and I send it back to you, am I lobbying you? When I send out a kind of weekly policy update with details of what's happened in the Parliament, that might, that might be more information sharing. But if I happen to attach a briefing that kind of suggests you should vote a certain way on a bill, that may be steps over the line into kind of lobbying and influencing. So it's those kind of, the details that we'd be quite, quite happy to kind of help you pick out and try and get the right definition for lobbying behaviour. I think it's actually really difficult to actually define lobbies. At the level, perhaps, you know, organisations that we're all at, it, you know, it's much clearer. But, I mean, if we look at, you know, very much, you know, local campaigns from organisations, I mean, obviously the story today where the campaign group who are, are against the, new, the quarry at New Lanark, you know, that's been called in by Scottish Government. You know, they have run a very effective campaign uh, from, you know, professional organisations who are opposed to it to people who live in the area. Now, I'm sure they didn't spend that much money on their campaign, but actually it was very effective and, in effect, it was lobbying. And that's, that's absolutely fine. And the interesting thing in terms of, if you're trying to find lobbying in the third sector, where we have many grassroots organisation members. And, you know, I said I was saying, where, where does that end? I mean, I, I was sitting to a grassroots organisation this week where I'm actually inviting to take part in a panel with the First Minister. Now, 
when, when they sit part in that panel, you know, they'll have a conversation with the First Minister. Will that be lobbying about their particular issue when, they, when they're talking to them? Or is that relationships and trust and information sharing? A really difficult one to actually define. And there's always been a problem defining lobbyists. It's, it's always seems clearer between, you know, the third sector and the private sector. But again, we are regulated. Most charities, all charities are regulated by OSCAR, where it's very much you're acting in the common good. Your values, your mission has been you know, agreed and you are regulated. So actually, you know, there's a case for the third sector, you know, being exempt from any lobbying registration because actually we are already regulated and have to act within the Oscar guidance as, you know, it's a bit like the MSP's code of conduct. So there's a conduct there for third sector organisations already and how they behave and campaign. Just to be clear, you're making the point that if there were to be a financial threshold, that would not really be the appropriate one to to have because often lobbying can be comparatively free from cost. It can. It can. Very, very many grassroots organisations and I mean I was at a, a session of the Poverty Truth Commission on Friday which is a fantastic organisation, brings together lots of very small grassroots organisations, community activists who are lobbying very strongly and campaigning against poverty. Now we, we don't want to see organisations like that you know, having to register. So you would have to be very clear, if you have a register, what your definition is and where the thresholds lie. And obviously, think very carefully about the third sector, because as, as I say, you know, we are already regulated in what we do. Richard Lyon. Yes, thank you. Uh, <coughs> thank you, convener. I, I want to concentrate on the point that Mr Downey made there a second ago, that uh, basically when you're meeting, you know, people phone MSP's office, want to meet with you. People come to our surgery, in fact, also, and, and, and want to talk to us about various various items. Do you think this, if this became a bill, this would drive people away from this parliament or uh, not encourage MSPs to see as many people as they do because it is so accessible? I, I think it would. I think the democratic access and tradition in the Parliament, you know, is one of its, the processes are one of its strengths. But as I said earlier, we do have a, pro, uh, a problem with democracy in Scotland because we've got a million people nearly disengaged from politics, actually mostly in our poorest communities. That's where people are not voting at a local government election or a national government election, and that's where the disengagement is. Now, I don't think a, a lobbying register is going to make any difference to that, that the onus there for me is is on the you know political parties and politicians to get out and engage more. But I think you know people might feel as if a very small grassroots organisation, if you run into your MSP in the supermarket or on the bus or on the train, and actually do you have to report that conversation? Now I accept what Dave said. We would have thresholds and limits if you ha if you had a register, but actually you are talking about real engagement with real people, and that's what we don't want to limit. I mean, for SCVO, I don't think there would be any problem in, compli uh, in complying with a, a register if it was introduced. What we're concerned about is our small and medium-sized members and grassroots organisations. Can, can I, can I, can I, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, can I come in on that just because I, I am one of those uh, small, small organisations. Zero Tons is a tiny charity of only six staff members. And I don't think um, any kind of registration of lobbying would deter people from seeking to make contact with their MSPs. I think people get in contact because they've got something that feels really important and they want to be heard. And any kind of process that opens up the Parliament that looks at you know, making it more transparent probably gives more pe people more confidence that they will be heard and actually they don't have to, to you know, be wearing a sharp suit. They don't have to be you know, specialist and knowledgeable about this, this place to engage with it. Um, I think that... that small organisations probably have quite a lot to gain from, from uh, more transparency because we're not on an, an equal playing field at all. You know, my organisation has a third of a third of, of a week, basically, to engage in this kind of activity, and the rest of the time we're, we're, we're doing other things. Um, Whereas most, uh, you know, big uh, charities have got a full-time public affairs person, uh, maybe two or three, maybe people who have public affairs as part of a role in other jobs. Uh, maybe they can afford occasionally to engage paid for uh, lobbyists. Um, we're not on an equal playing field at all, and I think actually um, anything that opens up the Parliament is, has got to be a good thing. I don't, I don't personally think that people would be deterred from having a conversation with their MSP because they would think, oh, this is going to be captured as lobbying now. I, I don't see that happening. 
I think the question about individuals is is quite important because and I know this ends up being a battle of examples, but um, um, uh, it seems to me that the question to any individual or the question that any individual would have to ask themselves is, um, am I financially gaining either through my employment or through the operation of a, an agency or, or a fee through the activities that I'm undertaking? I will give an example. If I bring in 10, inverted commas, ordinary trade unionists to give evidence on the living wage as individuals, my personal view is that they shouldn't be asked to, um, asked to, to register that, but, but I should, because um, I was the one who was bringing it in. I'm employed to do that. I'm, I'm coordinating a policy response and seeking to influence. So, as I say, I know it's a battle of examples, but it seems to me that the individual's one, the constituent um, and other ones, is... I think we're in danger of overcomplicating that. It seems to me that the, 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 the question of um, financial gain um, is, is probably the one that, that would define um, uh, whether an individual should um, register or not. Uh, before I go back to Cameron, did you catch my eye, Mr Finlay? Uh, no, it's OK. Uh, right. Just at the moment, Kivino, let right, I'll go back go to, first. I'll go back to Cameron. Thank you. What worries me is, that, do you think it's going to, if we have a lobbying thing, it's going to affect the Parliament's reputation for openness, accountability and the sharing of power. That's what I think we're concerned with. What are your opinions on that? I think it would enhance that reputation. I think at the moment it's so hard to know, you know, if, if, if something's happening in the Parliament, who has been discussing it, what the, the interests are. Um, you know, one of the examples, uh, you know, that we've been engaged in is looking at the, the sex industry. And, um, you know, that's an industry that is, is basically becoming a fairly you know, clear struggle between private commercial bodies who with a profit-making interest and organisations who are looking at it as a public health issue, as an exploitation issue, a violence against women issue. Um, and we find it very, very hard to find out who's engaging on these issues, particularly from the, the commercial corporate vested interest side, who is actually um, meeting with MSPs. Some of those people are not um, employed. Some of those people are not professional lobbyists. Um, I think anything that opens up the, the process and lets us know who MSPs are meeting with, who they're uh, discussing things with, what information they're receiving, you know, how they're reaching the, the, the decisions they're reaching, that has to be a good thing. Say I absolutely, sorry, I <laughs> absolutely agree with what Jenny's just said. Um, we, we often talk about how open and transparent and easy the Parliament is to come in and talk to you, um, but we forget that there are people who find this an incredibly intimidating procedure to come in um, and meet people. And if we can kind of demystify that procedure and you know make it clear these are the kind of things we talk to people about, you could quite easily do it as well. That would be a positive thing. A question for Mr Downey. Just, you talked a lot about grassroots organisations and small charities and the possible impact on them, uh, but do you not accept that quite a lot of your members are large organisations and some of them are competing for quite substantial public contracts? And do you not think that because um, they are shaping public policy that they should be required to register? I accept, you know, we get, I think, you know... I think of the, of the top top hundred charities in Scotland by scale, you know, we have most of them as as members, and I think they are in in a, in a different situation. And there are obviously, you know, there's a much greater role for the third sector in the delivery of public services, and you know that has been a trend over over the last uh, few years. And actually, yes, they are, and it is probably difficult for some organisations who perhaps have a strong campaigning role in a particular health area but also deliver services uh, and on behalf of their client group either for a, a local authority mostly local authorities they are competing for local uh, for contracts with the private sector but actually you know they're usually clearly defined signs on that but you know I, I don't see that as a, as a major issue on this but in general I think you know, the different perceptions and, and where the, the third sector is coming from, they've talked about financial gain. Now, you could agree or disagree, but, you know, most, most charities there are acting on behalf of the common or public good, however they may define it, in, in, you know, in, in terms of their status or their charitable mission. So, actually, most of them are not doing it for financial gain. Their lobbying is not for financial gain. It may be, for example, they're campaigning on mental health issues, you know, to get... Scottish Government to introduce a mental health strategy as, as it did last year. So it's not, you know, it's not in terms of financial gain. If you look at things like climate change legislation, minimum price for alcohol, uh, the smoking ban, that's about the people of Scotland's health and our environment. So that's, 
another area which uh, it needs to be thought through very carefully. Gain is, is very important uh, in this because what one person's view of public gain is, another person's can be completely contrary. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Dave says that we're in a battle of examples, which we are. And uh, let me give you a couple. Um, there are significant uh, organisations um, who are competing for public contracts, who are charities and who are third sector organisations. Now, they are quite entitled to do that. They may believe that they're acting for public gain, but if they're replacing a public sector worker, if that contract is lost, then that public sector worker might think that they are not acting for public gain. Or another example, I notice... I, SC I wonder, Mr. If we would focus on questions, perhaps I, we will get statements. to but we're No, no, examples. I'm giving you a bit of role, yeah. but not too much. And the last, um, the last um, membership list that I could find, for example, for SCVO, and I don't, I don't think they publish membership lists anymore, was 2005, and it says that, for example, the Equality Network are a member. Now, at the moment, we're in the debate about gay marriage, which is very topical. I don't know, because I can't check the list, but I'm, I would expect possibly Scotland for Marriage are a member of SEO. So you have two organisations that are completely polarised on this, both of whom would argue that they are in, uh, working for the public gain, but who have completely contrasting positions. Mr. So Finlay. My, my, my point is that that argument that you put forward that charities only work for public gain is a very contentious statement. And that do, so do you agree? I think that, that, that's an issue where you could have... Uh, a strong debate for. On the other side of that argument, you know, we could equally argue that you know, the, you know, uh, public sector trade unions who are lobbying against the third sector's greater role uh, for uh, in public services, you know, and as equal. So we have, we have, you know, we, 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 we would agree, which is why we register. <laughs> and that's, but I think that, that that's the debate you would you would need to have. But actually, interestingly, obviously, in terms of, and, and we I have to say, if you look at. You know the issues that we have, perhaps with Oscar and the regulator, and actually uh, given you know regulating arm, local authority arms length organisations as charities, which we totally disagree with. It comes into I think that debate, and but in general I think you know that you know we can all give examples, but in general most third sector organisations are acting and campaigning for the public good. I accept you know there, there, there's areas where there, there's strong debate and maybe disagreement. Can I just say from the convener's position that we're going to have to focus on questions, those this side of the table. Um, there will be opportunities for debate on another occasion, and I'll probably be a bit tighter um, from here on in, illuminating as the debate might be. Now, Richard caught my eye, and I'm conscious of the need to make progress time-wise as well. Uh, just a, a small question. Do you think a register would actually uh, encourage competing firms to actually compete more to see MSPs more. You know, it would drive up their... their uh, I've only seen them twice a month or whatever, or twice a year. Oh, oh they've saw them four times a year. I'm, 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 going, to, I'm going again more. Do you think that? Uh, I, I don't know the, I know the answer uh, to that. I think... I mean, funny enough, I think probably... I mean, I, I don't know in terms of the private sector, but I, I have the thought in terms of the Scottish Parliament, if you, if you looked at, you know... Uh, who'd been in most often uh, to see MSPs over the last year, uh, probably as third sector organisations, you know, because actually there, are, there is probably more than, you know, in terms of private sector organisations who, who are lobbying. And, and that's perfectly good from my point of view, but, you know, it, it's up to then the MSP to judge the merits of those organisations, the merits of their case and what they're coming to talk about, whether that's public procurement, Health and social care, the public bodies bill at the moment is, is, is an issue that we're talking about amendments, procurements coming up next month. And I'm sure MSPs have had lots of representation from the private sector, third sector, and you know, a whole range of other organisations. Uh, and actually, that's where we put our trust in the judgment of, of MSPs. Uh, who will talk about some of the practicalities? Thank you. Convener. I've been a bit uncomfortable with the way some of the questions have been going um, because I thought looking at a register for lobbyists was about making sure that we were transparent so that there was no undue influence possibly created by the financial muscle of a commercial lobbyist. Um, but 
I want to look at the practicalities if we do decide on having a register. And I was very conscious last week when we had professional organisations and that each of those professional organisations said that their members, commercial lobbyists, had to register with them. It's a voluntary register and we tried to tease out what that register meant. And as the charities have told us today, they have to register with Oscar for other conditions. So I was wondering, if we have a register, what information should be included in it? But before we get to, should we have a standalone register of lobbyists, is there any way that the current system for commercial and voluntary organisations registering within their own professional uh, bodies, would that be sufficient? Or do we need to have a register? And if we do, what should it be? What should be included in it? Um, my answer to the first, first part of that question is that I don't think it would be sufficient because, um, number one, because it's voluntary, and I don't believe the scheme should be voluntary. I'm, I'm talking about the registration within within professional organisations, but there's a, but organisations organisations aren't mandated to be members of their professional organisations. I mean, I'll give you an example, a very good one. The RCN has submitted, um, which is a trade union, has submitted evidence to you. The RCN aren't a member of the STUC. Um, so it wouldn't work in that case. Um, the RCN wouldn't necessarily have an organisation with whom they could um, they, they could fulfil the function that you described. So I, I wouldn't see that as being enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, also I think um, charities that are members of OSCAR, you know, that that's about making sure that they have good governance, that they, you know, have financial probity, all those kind of things, but it wouldn't capture uh, this kind of activity. Um, so I don't, I don't think that would be sufficient. I think for me, in, t in terms of if there was a register, the, the key criteria, the thing I would be most interested in seeing is it being searchable by whether or not the person who is conducting any kind of lobbying contact is doing so from a, a, a charitable organisation or a trade union or a commercial organisation. I think that the, the, the real you know, thing that's underlying this for, for us, for our organisation, is getting behind... Um, commercial interests in the Parliament, and that's what we would be most interested in seeing. I think, in terms of the third side, I think the, the, the Oscar example is interesting because I think, it, it, as you probably are aware, uh, if you know that the Oscar issued guidance, you know, a few months ago in terms of third sector's engagement in, in the referendum campaign and independence, and they were actually what they did was they put a consultation paper people responded and actually then issued guidance on the way charities should engage you know, in the referendum campaign and actually it was fairly light touch, it was very clear and actually about what you should be saying, what you should be doing and, and if you were for example taking a position that it had to meet you know, your charitable aims, you, you have to, you know, board of trustees had to agree that and actually you know, uh, you were very clear on the processes, taking legal advice and others. But actually, it, it was actually a really good example of them responding to a changing situation and to give charities guidance on, you know, what is a fair, it was a fairly tricky situation because charities were unsure about how to engage and what the rules were for them. So actually, the regulator in this case has issued, you know, updated guidance. And actually, all regulation does move on. I mean, Sarah talked about the cross-party groups. And actually... And I think all these things need to be under review, but we have a number of codes that do help. And if we strengthen some of them, could actually improve you know, some of the transparency issues that people are talking about. But that's purely from a third sector point of view. Obviously, on the commercial side, that's, that's entirely yeah. different. Just continue on that theme then, if we do decide that we need a register, because I think no decision has been made, but I think we have to tease this out. If we do decide we have a register, who should administer the register? Um, we've had suggestions with Scottish Information Commissioner, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life, the Parliament itself, possibly through this committee, or should we set up a completely new regula re regulator for registering lobbyists? We don't have a strong position on who it should be, but it should certainly be somebody who's got the kind of capacity to take it on. Um, Again, I'll go for the example of the cross-party group. If I have a question about the annual return, the minutes, it's answered very quickly and efficiently by this committee. You know, you're, you're talking about a much larger scale here, people registering their lobbying behaviour themselves. They're, 
uh, particularly at first, are going to have a lot of questions, I would imagine. So it, it's got to be someone with the capacity to help people out with that, possibly training, assistance, advice on that. So that would be my point on who should be maintaining and administering it. I mean, I mean, obviously, there's lots of examples from the Children's Commissioner, you know, the Information Commissioner, and and, and others who report, uh, who are independent but report uh, to the Parliament and are appointed by the Parliament. So I think, you know, that there are, you know, strong examples there of, of of any process that you know the Parliament could introduce if you were having a register. So I, I think, you know, there are strong examples. Some of them worked, some haven't. But I think that's where that kind of route would be. If we have go down this route, obviously if you have to register, and there are rules for registering and what you can do, we have to monitor it. Should there be sanctions if you don't comply? And what would you suggest should the sanctions be? Sorry for John here, because he's having to move into hypothesis because yeah, he doesn't yeah. particularly support it. So I suppose I, sh I should step in here. I mean, I think um, a system for registration without any form of sanction I wouldn't support because I think there should be some form of sanction, although it's fair to say that exposure is, is something of a, of, of a sanction in itself. So it could well be argued that in many cases the, um, you know, the, pen the penalty, um, the biggest part of the penalty would be possibly reputational rather than financial. Um, but I do believe that both in terms of access to the parliament itself, i.e. one could potentially limit it or limit it for a, a, for a period of time um, as a consequence of the failure to, to comply. I haven't got a fixed um, view on financial penalty, but I tend to think that particularly in the case where you know, commercial interest can be shown, that some sort of proportionate um, uh, um, uh, financial impediment might be appropriate. I haven't given much thought about the judicial elements of that, I have to say. I think part part of the issue is, is obviously I mean, if you set up a register, it, you know it's a professionalisation, you know, or, or, of it, and, and, and more professionalisation of lobbies, lobbying, which actually tends to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, fairly professional, particularly you know around giving evidence to to, to Parliament and government. Uh, so I think, in terms of how you register, how you do that, any administrative burdens would need to be, you know make sure that they're, they're simple and, and enable organisations uh, to comply. In terms of sanctions, you know, uh, and any of these things, I think reputation, as they've said, I mean, is a, is a key factor. Organisations do want to be transparent in their engagement. And obviously the other thing there is, you know, where does the register stop and start? We're talking about the Scottish Parliament, but actually if we look at the decisions made by local government, you know, for crucial decisions, you know, and planning, education, help, uh, you know, I think you know that fact is not factored into the debate yet, but I think that's another area where the committee would have to look at because actually it's not just about the Scottish Parliament; it's actually about our democracy as a whole. And actually, where does the you know any register? Because you know, local government is getting lobbied, you know, probably more than actually the Scottish Parliament. So I think that's an area of debate that the committee may should be wanting to look at. Can I can I just come into agree with, Sorry, with Dave? Just, before we leave, Mr. Downey, can I just be clear? Is Mr Downey advocating the need for action in relation to local government when he's perhaps advocating that there is not a need in relation to the Scottish Parliament? I, I'm just saying, I think if, if you're looking at a, a debate on a register, I, think you, I don't think you can just confine it to you know, the Scottish Parliament and MSPs because actually uh, lobbying takes place at you know, uh, all different levels in Scotland. From, I mean, for example, if we're taking let's say large supermarkets, the biggest issue they're concerned about is, you know, planning. And with all due respect, that's, that's not within, you know, that's not a decision for MSPs, that's a decision for local elected members. And actually, so I think it's an area where, I think, if you're thinking about a, lo a lobbying register, it's an area where, you know, MS, you, know, you have to consider within the bill where does lobbying stop start. I just want to be clear whether... SCBO, represented by you today, Mr Downey, is in principle opposed to a register, or whether within the confines of what we are trying to establish, which is in relation to the Parliament, you think it's not necessary in relation to the Parliament, but in principle you would not be opposed to a register if its compass was bigger. 
I, I, the second part of your question, I, I think we, we would go back and, and talk. But in terms of what was proposed at the moment, I obviously said we, in principle we are, we are opposed to it because we don't think there's an issue well, of the Parliament. Yes. But that's our position. But if you were introducing a register, then obviously we would need to consider the scale, the scope, and come back to the committee with our views on where it should stop and where it should start in relation to democracy and elected members throughout Scotland. I think that would be your next issue if you... Okay. Let, me, let me move on to Jenny Kim. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to the, the point of, about sanction and agree with, with Dave's point that a regime that didn't have any sanctions attached wouldn't, wouldn't be valuable. Uh, but also I think we need to be careful about um, just being realistic about the difference between an organisation whose prime purpose is to lobby, you know, it's well resourced, that is very able to comply with a, a regime because it is someone whose job it is to do so, and a very small charity or community group, a grassroots group, that might forget or that might not get the paperwork because they don't have an office or you know that might uh, be acting in the, in the very best of faith but actually not keep up to date with the register and we maybe have to have some way of trying to distinguish whether there's been administrative oversight or, or you know change of staff that kind of thing um, or whether there, there's some kind of deliberate evasion going on I think I think that's important that's this isn't it that's that's the number of this whole thing you know is, the, is this because we're concerned that commercial companies who lobby us have an undue advantage because of their financial muscle? And if we introduce it because of those people, does it then impact on the smallest of charities who, you know, as, as Mr Downey has, has said, <coughs> are doing it for the absolute most legitimate of reasons? So moving on from that, and my last question is, if we are going down that route, what do we do about how do we resource it? Is it a fee-based system? Therefore, the big, large commercial company has to pay the fee, can afford it, it's part of its job. What about the small local charity? If we impose a fee, you can't pay the fee, you can't register to lobby, so you can't. So thoughts on how we resource it, should it be fee-based and how that fee level should be reached? And if you want to maybe think about it and write back to us because we're short of time. Is that helpful, convener? Uh, that's mildly helpful. <laughs> brief answer. We are a, a, a brief answer. On that. I mean, uh, we will come back to. You, but I, I think it's interesting. It would depend on very much the scope. Obviously, you know, uh, SCB have said publishing MSPs' diaries and having more information there is a way to do this. But actually, some people have obviously said that diaries don't cover emails, texts, messages, telephone calls, or a whole range of other things. And actually. That, that is where you get into the tricky territory of the administrative burden, what information is there, and actually that depends then on, uh, that would be a, a big cost factor for organisations and time. So it's, it, I don't think it's just about the monetary aspect of uh, a fee, because certainly I mean, SCV in terms of our membership is stratified in terms of the scale and size of organisations. Um, one sentence, um, no, no fee um, and a simplified, I would argue, online system which allows people to sort themselves out of the process very quickly by asking some, by answering some, some fairly straightforward initial questions. So you try and clear as many people out of consideration as possible in your first couple of questions and I think online would be, uh, would, would be the starting point for that. I would say no fee as well. I think that would not align with the founding principles of the Parliament. I think the money for it would have to come from the public purse. Short answer, yeah, no fee. That was the response given by our members when we asked them about this. Right, can I move on to Richard Lyle? Thank you, Kinzina. Should there be a threshold for registration and what exemptions should, be, should there be from the register? Um, I, uh, I won't be able to give you a precise kind of figure for this, but I believe that it's, it's reasonable to look at whether um, uh, cost is incurred, money is spent, as opposed to um, uh, voluntary activity undertaken, and that it's reasonable to um, place some limit, some cost limit on that. I, I, I don't have enough knowledge um, to state exactly what that limit should be, but I, I, I do think that, um, that cost and expenditure is probably, is probably the best starting point in terms of sorting um, voluntary activity from paid activity. I'm not sure about exemptions. I think uh, that's a really difficult area because the whole sort of driving force of this, the whole purpose of it, is, is about opening up, uh, you know, the parliament to, to further scrutiny. Um, 
and I, I, I'm not convinced that there are uh, strong arguments that anyone should be, be exempt. I mean, we're a, a really, really small charity and obviously weary about burden, and that's why in our written submission we said we were still open to persuasion. We weren't convinced about the need for a register, but I think if there was to be a register, we would want to be included in it. I don't think we should be exempt just because we're a small charity. But I, I, I agree, you know, that it shouldn't be burdensome, but... I'd, I'd be anxious about it, um, exempting too many people because then you lose you lose the thrust of why we're we're, we're looking at this. Obviously, I mean, I, I mean, I, I, I've mentioned the exemption in terms of the third sector before, but I think a lot of responses you got from third sector organisations obviously highlighted the difference between, you know, uh, commercial lobbyists and third sector lobbyists, if I can invert the commas. So, I, and actually, a lot of the submissions actually said that. You know, uh, said third sector should be exempt, and I think that would be the big area of debate for the sector. If there was a register, you know, we would be coming back and you know and arguing that case. I'm not sure it's fair to say that the voluntary sector and the third sector support exemptions for themselves. Certainly, the most of our members that we've talked to would be perfectly happy to appear on a register. What they're concerned about is the level of burden, how much information they're, they're going to have to provide, record, that kind of thing. Um, th that's the real issue, I think, here, not exempting themselves from it. They're, they're perfectly happy to appear on a register. There's one question I want to ask the Muscats must ask. Um, we have <clears throat> various MSPs who are on very powerful committees and MSPs who are on committees that are actually, um, you know, you were talking earlier on about the different bills that went to the health committee. So, for instance, if someone wanted to come and see me on every bill, uh, you know, I'd soon rack up seeing this organisation, that organisation, as I have done, you know, and then someone would say, why has he seen these people, but they forget it's because of all these different bills? Would that not then make certain MSPs turn around and say, well, whoa, I'm not going to see these people because I don't want to be on the register 20 times, as against my friend Cameron, who's only on the register once? I, I think if you, you know, in, in, in confidence, are meeting with people because you think you can get good information for them to make, you know, help you make the best evidenced decisions... You know, you should feel absolutely comfortable with that, and I, I, I would hope we wouldn't move to a culture where people are going to start bean counting and saying they've had three meetings and they've had four and they've had two. And you know, I, I think it, and it was perhaps Dave earlier on that said the word lobbying is becoming pejorative, and we certainly mentioned that in our submission that we don't want lobbying to be seen as something that's that's in and of itself a, a bad activity. Lobbying is just about sharing information and about trying to get to really good decision making. Um, so I, I, I would hope that that. It wouldn't be a deterrent that, you know, you, if you were involved in a really chunky bill and having lots and lots of meetings about it, that you would feel good. You know, I'm doing my job here. I'm actually finding everything out I need to know to inform my decisions on this committee um, and about this bill, and that people wouldn't start questioning that activity and, and seeing it as a bad thing. And maybe it's the word lobbying itself has got a, a kind of negative connotation. We, we maybe need to just look at information sharing or something like that. Actually, I, I think, you know, as, you know MSPs kind of publishing that information, whether it's via diaries or anything else, is actually quite a good thing, because in a sense, what you're publishing is, we'll use the word lobbying again, is a, is a lobbying contact report or an engagement re, you know, report that you, you're talking to in terms of which organisations you're talking to and what about, whether it's health and social care or amendments to the procurement bill. Uh, you know, I think finding a way to do that through the current system actually would be very helpful and, and would add to, to transparency. And obviously we've suggested, you know, the diaries are, are, are a way to do that because actually you could then say, I attended X dinner hosted by, sponsored by, and these were the attendees, for example. Uh, and I know that, you know, at SCVO, when we invite MSPs to events, I mean, we've invited committees to engage with us on, on certain issues, you know, but actually the interesting thing is we always make sure that actually the majority of people there are our members and actually, you know, MSPs ask us what, what would be the cost of that dinner so they can think about where they need to register, who's going to attend, you know, and elsewhere. And if that was actually published in diaries, I think that, that would help, you know, the transparency in what we're seeing. I don't, I don't think it would end up a competition, but I think it, it would be helpful if MSPs started thinking about a kind of contact report of who they're engaging with. Okay. Um, 
with permission of the chair, um, my counter example is I was at the um, backbench SNP trade union group yesterday. We do the same with the Labour Party as well. Um, the way that is set up is a number of MSPs come and meet with a number of trade unionists on an agenda of three or four issues. I had one issue to raise. Um, I think it was more, it's more appropriate for me to say what issue I went to raise and lobby on than to expect the MSP who came amongst other MSPs to speak on an agenda of three or four items to, to be, the, to be the, the person who completely captures the important information that was, um, that, that was happening there. Far more simple for me to say, I was lobbying on civil justice. I went to the SNP trade union group to be there and these were the MSPs who were there. I would report that to my organisation so I wouldn't I would report it to the parliament. Question from George Adam. Yes, thank you, convener, and apologies for my lateness. I was in time till I got to the lift, and my sprinting up four flights of stairs was less than successful. <laughs> so, uh, just one of the questions I'd like to ask is other jurisdictions. You know, we had some evidence from uh, some members at uh, uh, the last meeting with regards to the Westminster Bill that's going through. Now, I'm paraphrasing what they said, but they believed it was complete pants and there was nothing to learn from it. <laughs> I'm just paraphrasing what the witnesses said. But still said. be careful. Uh, and uh, basically, I'm just asking, uh, you know, is there anything to learn, I'm asking yourselves, from that bill? You know, and uh, is there anything else? Some of the other uh, evidence we received was Canada and America. Hi, Washington in particular had uh, uh, quite a extensive lobbyists and uh, bills as well, or uh, op systems there where it was transparent and you were able to see. I think they said Canada was one of the best. So uh, is there anything we can learn from anywhere else in the world that could be added to a potential uh, bill? To go for the UK example, I think this is probably something we we're on in agreement with, John. Um, it's been called the gagging law, yep. as it now is. Um, and the real issue that we have with that is it's setting kind of spending limits uh, on non-party campaigning, which could impact on us. We're, um, we're not clear on kind of quite what the implications of that might be for us yet, but that was a real concern. So I have to say, really happy that that doesn't seem to be an issue in Scotland. Nobody is suggesting that there would be limits on the amount we could spend. It's more about being transparent about what we're spending, who we're seeing, what we're talking about, and that's certainly a good thing. Yep, I would totally agree. The, the gagging uh, uh, bill, uh, you know, there's nothing to learn from that. That will actually, you know... Uh, Put democracy back and and, uh, and hamper the campaigning of you know third sector organisations. I, I I think we can always learn from uh, other orga. I don't know enough about the the US or the Canadian one in detail to actually answer that. But I'm sure uh, there will be areas where you can learn from it. Uh, probably Canada more than America. If I think. Yeah, I haven't looked into uh, what happens in other countries, but I would be. I'd be a bit anxious about comparing with America because it's such a money-soaked democracy and the political action committees there are, you know, multi-billion dollar um, organisations. I don't think we've got any parallel with that, really. So it might be useful for, for someone uh, who's involved in this um, to look at, you know, other small nations with relatively accessible uh, parliaments and and see what kind of practice they have. I don't. I don't know what we could learn from America. I do. I do share the concerns of uh, Sarah and John about the the UK. Uh, I think uh, the UK bill looks like it will preclude a lot of legitimate um, third sector campaigning, um, and and there's some concern that that is is a deliberate, you know, not an intended consequence. Um, so I think we need to be very very careful not to preclude, um, you know, legitimate contact. Just a very specific point on that. I mean, I wouldn't even mention Section 3 of that bill, which is entirely designed to, um, to attack trade unions, because that's nothing to do with this, um, uh, this committee's consideration. Um, what it does is it confuses public campaigning, which it massively over-regulates and subscribes, with activity... Um, within and uh, within parliaments designed specifically to influence the decision-making process of a particular uh, MP or, or government, and it under-regulates that. So it under-regulates where it should be regulating more and over-regulates in terms of um, public campaigning, and that's a mistake not to make. Well, I think, we, uh, convener, just uh, we shouldn't get mixed up, uh, like confuse the funding of political parties and lobbying and I think that's the issue in America that's the, uh, but the actual lobbying system is rather good there. Um, uh, could I ask just a couple of quick brief points each year organisations or the, the organisations you represent, do you have an estimate as to how much public money they receive do you think 
it's important that we have the, the, the utmost scrutiny on that public money and it's open and transparent. And finally, do you train people within your organisations to lobby? That one first. Um, so Children in Scotland, just in case you're not aware, we're uh, the national membership agency uh, for those working with and for children in Scotland. So we've got over 400 members and that's a real mixture of statutory, professional and the voluntary sector. So most of the local authorities are members of Children in Scotland. So it is a mixture. In terms of our funding, some of that is core funding that comes, comes from the government. Some of that is membership money uh, that comes from our members and some of it is raised through things like events and training and then from separate grants. So for all of those, we're absolutely you know, accountable. We report to, to the government on how their money's being spent. We report to our funders on how their money's being spent, what it's being used for, and we report back to our members through our board reports, annual reports to them. So I, I'm, I, as far as I'm concerned, we're completely transparent about how all the money that we get in is going out and what it's being used for. Um, in terms of training um, our staff and members on lobbying, I, I wouldn't say that that's something we've done. We've certainly um, made attempts to kind of connect them uh, with, with decision makers. We, we held an event in November which was a part of UK Parliament Week that invited in an MP and a member of the House of Lords and people, we got really good feedback on that. They said that was something that they'd never really thought about doing before. They, were, they felt that quite disconnected with, with Westminster and we feel it's our role to, to help our members kind of connect with elected representatives. Uh, in terms of uh, SCVO, as the umbrella organisation for the third sector in Scotland, we do get a core contribution from Scottish Government. Uh, we also run uh, programmes like Community Job Scotland, which has been highly successful getting young people into uh, work in the last few years with a consortium of 500 organisations there. And obviously, all our can easily submit it to the committee or last annual report in terms of you know our funding. We also uh, do run an extensive kind of training programme for the sector and you know part of that is about engaging with parliaments and government and even you know next month at a major conference the gathering we're doing an event with uh, the European Commission's office in Scotland about how people engage in the sector engages with the European Parliament because they're obviously it's another area there so we do work very uh, hard to ensure that our members think about engagement with uh, public bodies, how they do that. We don't particularly train our staff uh, in lobbying. It's more about their uh, communication skills and actually other areas, which I suppose they use in effect for lobbying. But actually, it, we, we don't particularly say this is it's more about engagement. Uh, can I just say we welcome the submission to which you referred, Mr Moxon. Uh, yeah, we received probably um, towards £2 million pounds of public money. The large majority of that is our administration of the Trade Union Learning Fund, which is a shared, uh, a, a shared programme with, with, with government and dispersed to our member unions. We have a government and parliament officer whose precise duty is to attempt to um, uh, um, expedite positive policy outcomes for the STUC and our members. We don't formally run training sessions, but we do offer ourselves to our member organisations uh, to provide support and advice in how they might uh, approach the Parliament and specific MSPs. Um, zero Tolerance uh, receives Scottish Government funding uh, for our core costs at the moment, so uh, we did say in our submission that uh, makes us doubly aware of the need to be very open and transparent and, and um, like Children in Scotland, we also bring in other grant monies and money from uh, training activities and that kind of thing. And we, like all charities operating under the Oscar regime, we're fully, fully accountable and report back to all the funders that we, we are very lucky to receive funding from. Um, we don't uh, have a big staff team, so we don't train people in the organisation to lobby, but a bit like Children in Scotland, we do try and facilitate access to the Parliament for uh, our supporters. We're not a membership organisation, but we have supporters. So we hold events. Um, in the Parliament uh, for young activists or for trainee journalists and that kind of thing, uh, because we want them to, to see this as somewhere that they can engage and, and have some influence. Uh, if it's a question, not a point, um, to Mr. As a, as a, as a, as a question, uh, Mr. Downey, are you, are you aware that last year um, SCVO ran a course running from £100 to £230, whether you're a member or a non member? And the purpose of the course was to how we can influence policy development, which routes are most effective for voluntary organisations, how can we get our message across effectively, what are the pros and cons of different lobbying tools and the pitfalls to avoid? Well, I think that's a perfectly legitimate course to run for our members in terms of the engagement with the democratic process 
and the parties. And the reason is different is if you're a member, you get it for £100. If you're a non-member, you're a third sector organisation, it obviously costs you uh, well, the 200 whatever it costs you. And I think, as we say, we, we are very open. That we are there to help facilitate our members' engagement with the Parliament. And actually, every time we have events at the Parliament, our last parliamentary reception in December, we had uh, the manager of Fife Gingerbread as our main speaker, because actually we're trying to get the message across of actually well, what their experience and their uh, issues are, rather than SCVOs. So you know we're quite open that you know we do run whether it's lobbying you know, or engagement. Out. I, I I'm finding this line of questioning really strange, and it's really making me focus on why we're doing this and why we're doing the inquiry. Because when I worked in the voluntary sector, I was employed specifically to take volunteers and train them in order to be able to sit at board meetings of the health board. So I trained them to do that job because I thought that made them better volunteers, better able to represent. So I'm getting really confused about what this bill's about, convener. Well, can, can, can I just say that's perhaps a, a subject to which we will return? Um, I just finally give each uh, member of our panel an opportunity to say up to 100 words, that's about one minute or less, uh, just to cover any points that we haven't otherwise covered or to re-emphasise important points. And I'll start on the left with Sarah Collier, if I may. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we've run out of time before we got down into the detail of things like, I guess, who, sh who should be on the, the register. I know that was covered in one of your other evidence sessions. Just, I guess, to give an example... Um, say perhaps a, a charity shop manager who happens to speak to an MSP when they come in about a policy issue. That's, that's not the type of thing we would want to see on a lobbying register, but the, their director of policy, who is a former MSP, real life example, um, he certainly should be on the register. Um, so th th that's one of the issues, I guess, that, that we'd certainly want to look at further. And just, I guess, to reiterate the points that I've already made, um, ourselves, most of the members we've heard from, absolutely happy. Um, to be on a, a register of lobbying because the voluntary sector is such a large proportion um, of, of lobbyists in Scotland. There's also a crossover that the voluntary sector sometimes employs commercial lobbyists to do work on their behalf. That's something that needs to be considered. And we're absolutely happy to, to comply with any requirements on lobbying, um, just so long as it's useful to someone and that we're not recording information that no one ever reads. <laughs> I mean, obviously, you know, in principle, we're opposed to the register and we've ad advocated the publishing of MSPs' diaries because, actually, I think we believe that, you know, MSPs and politicians at all levels in Scotland are responsible for the transparency of their activities, not those who wish to engage with them. And I think that's the public office and is, is making that much more transparent in terms of its decision-making, who people are meeting, if, if that's what you want. Oxen. Yeah, I mean, I agree that the, the primary purpose of this bill should be to regulate commercial activity and gain, but consistency requires that where um, uh, lobbying activity is undertaken which has an economic or, um, or power impact, irrespective of whether it turns a profit for somebody, needs to be, in, needs, needs to be um, included in the um, in the bill, um, so I would I would I would absolutely un uh, underline the fact that if the register is created in a way that it appears to be a pejorative, which is essentially the good guys aren't on it and the bad guys are on it, then I think it would fail in its aim because it, you would then introduce disincentive uh, effects. In a sense, what we need is incentives for as many people as possible to be content to join the register, um, because that makes it, as I say, a more, a more positive thing rather than a pejorative, which I think has got, um, uh, has got risks attached to it. You can? Um, yeah, I, I suppose I just want to reiterate that um, I think that the, the lobbying uh, that happens on, on behalf of the third sector is... You know, is a good thing. It's there to bring about change, um, and particularly for our organisation, it's there to advocate for some of the most vulnerable people in society whose voices are not heard and who will never be part of any kind of lobbying process. Um, and organisations like ours try to bring those voices into the, the parliament. Um, I, I, I do think it's really important that we we really you know look at the, the commercial interests and and distinguish between those and people who are really trying to just influence um, social change in Scotland. Um, and I, I would agree with some of the points that have been made about uh, burden and just making sure that this doesn't become burdensome uh, or, or pejorative. But um, I think, in general, you know, anything that aligns with the founding principles of the Parliament opens it up, makes it a more accessible place. It has to be a good thing. 
Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attendance and your contribution. Uh, should in the committee's reflection on the evidence session we identify any uh, further information that we may seek from you, I hope that we'll get a positive <coughs> response. Thank you very much. I now suspend the meeting briefly to allow change of witnesses. Recommence and let me uh, welcome our second panel today. Uh, we have uh, Richard Mon, who's the uh, head of campaigns for the CBI. The agenda shows him as CBI Scotland. I think strictly he's CBI, although of course it's the same organisation. Uh, we've Colin Borland, the head of external affairs in Scotland for the Federation of Small Businesses, and we have Fraser Kelly, uh, Social Enterprise Scotland. Uh, once again, uh, I'm not going to take opening statements. There will hopefully, if time permits, be an opportunity for concluding statements, which uh, seems to work rather better. So I'll start with Cara Hilton, if I may. Good morning, panel. Um, just a question for everyone. Um, to what extent do you think reform is required? Obviously, there's not been any major lobbying scandals at, Hol at Holyrood as yet. And as a supplementary to that, um, do you think that um, a, a register will lead to greater openness in the political process? It's up to um, you guys. Um, so, uh, firstly, I would say, uh, obviously, um, I think we can probably all agree that, that transparency in itself is a good thing. I think the, um, 
the question then becomes whether the means that we have currently are sufficient to deliver that transparency and what else we could do to deliver it. Um, I think that in this case, given the lack of evidence in Scotland that there is a problem with lobbying, um, we would argue that um, bringing forward new legislation, new regulation that might create additional burdens is not justified and is not a proportionate response. Yes, I think um, to largely echo that, we haven't seen, as we say in our written submission, any evidence that would make the compelling case for a extra statutory regulation. But we concede that we're not the experts um, in this field, and if the you know if the committee, after taking evidence, takes a contrary view and decides that it wants to proceed with um, a register, we do think it would be more effective to record uh, particular meetings rather than try to focus in. Um, particular classes of individual as having looked at it we think that would be difficult to the point of you know, impossibility. Good morning. Um, lobbying and campaigning we see as, as a good thing. It's part of an open and democratic process. Um, we believe that organisations and individuals should be encouraged as, as much as we possibly can to engage with um, elected politicians in the parliamentary process. Um, the, the fact that regulation doesn't exist at the moment, I think, creates a, an open and transparent and a, a fairly flexible process for that to be achieved. Um, the application of a register, um, I, I was interested in the previous comments uh, when people asked if there was anything that we could learn from the, the Westminster Bill. Um, I think there's lots that we could learn from that, and um, the, the fundamental would be not to do it in that way. Um, so I think we do have regulatory processes in place at the moment. Um, we should make those as effective as possible before we think about new legislation. Um, I just um, in the Code of Conduct for members of the Scottish Parliament places responsibilities on members in respect to their dealings with lobbyists and some consultant lobbyist firms have also got their own voluntary codes. Should responsibility for lying for registering lie with the lobbyists or with those um, being lobbied? I mean I think the, the the crucial question is here is who counts as a lobbyist and if we can get a workable definition of that then that question becomes a lot easier uh, to answer. I mean as we say in a written submission we think that would be quite difficult to arrive at and unless you can get something that is sufficiently clear that it would be a good enough definition to use in statutory regulation then it seems to be a neater and most more cost effective solution to um, have that responsibility with those who are being lobbied because after all they are you know, elected by us to exercise that sort of judgment yeah i think um, we, we would uh, echo a lot of that um, i think that, that clearly there are um, existing means um, of, of um, sort of guaranteeing tra transparency and guaranteeing probity in terms of um, MSPs dealings with external parties set out in the um, in the MSPs code. I think it's right that um, there are um, there are uh, expectations on those who who, who lobby to um, to adhere to um, similar kinds of principles. But I think that, that arguably through um, all of the existing means, um, we could say that they they already exist. I think we could. Is already very strong, but all lobbying should be as open and transparent as it possibly can be. I think there's a dual responsibility, both in terms of MSPs and organisations who are lobbying, to be as transparent as they can, both to the public, to the media, and through any other mechanism that they have. Um, I don't think there's a, an absolute responsibility that's required uh, on organisations or on MSPs individually. Um, it's a, it's a, a dual role and a, a, a collective responsibility. Uh, following up said George Adam. Yes, I'd just like to ask, you've mentioned about the idea of uh, MSPs having to publish details of meetings and things like that. You know, uh, if we went down that route, how would you how would you see that working out? You know, would that be instead of the register? I think you're kind of hinting that that might be the way you're thinking. Or would it be with the register as well? I think from our point of view, we naturally quite are attracted to solutions that look cost-effective and look simple. And if we had, you know, an enhanced... If the committee believes that you know there is an issue that needs to be addressed, if we had um, a register of those uh, meetings which were um, administered by those who were being lobbied, then that could be met within existing administrative budgets. Um, it could be you know met within you know um, existing resource allocations, and crucially, we wouldn't be trying to categorise individuals and we'll maybe come on to talk about membership organisations later but for organisations like ours that might present a few 
interests and challenges. We wouldn't have to do that and go down that sort of route, which would be fraught with difficulty. We could rely on the, frankly, the good judgment of our elected representatives who day in, day out, deal with you know, concepts such as reasonableness and how things should be presented. You, know, you as elected representatives know when someone's coming to talk to you as a constituent, and you know when someone's coming to try and influence you or advocate a particular policy line. I don't think there's a difficulty with you making that distinction. Where we see there could be an issue is with if you're asking, say, um, you know, a, local, a local small businessman. Um, whether you know, if he's making um, certain representations or involved in a particular campaign or, or a local issue, whether or not he should register and whether or not his me member of a membership organisation such as ours would further complicate that. So to remove that extra dimension, it seems neat and cost effective to um, have it vesting with you know, some sort of enhanced form of code of conduct for MSPs. Can I just uh, come in on, um, on, the, on the point around publishing sort of details of meetings? I think it's worth um, sort of saying that, uh, and, and, we, and we stress this in our, our submission, um, there are already details published of ministers' meetings with external parties. Um, now, that, um, that is a system that we think could certainly be strengthened. Um, it's, uh, the information is, is, is not sort of published in a timely fashion, we would, we would judge, um, and that, um, that, that very much sort of undermines the... Um, the overall purpose of, of doing so. I think we can have a conversation about um, about strengthening that system. Clearly, an extension of that is um, is uh, publishing the diaries of, of MSPs. The advantage of, of, of something like that is that um, if you if you look at the, the full panoply of, uh, of, of of people who lobby, the common factor is the um, is uh, the engagement with with the people at the centre. That's 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 the MSPs and and the government. And 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 again, echoing Colin's point about. Um, about making this the most simple um, kind of mechanism possible, um, it would seem to us um, uh, more persuasive to to kind of focus on um, on publishing the diaries of, of, of certainly government ministers, and we, and we can look in more detail at, at, at MSPs. That's not a point that we've we've come to a decision on yet. Can I just clear: Are you deliberately or just accidentally excluding officials who may be being lobbied, of course, as well, who in turn will influence elected members. Yeah. Terribly sorry. Um, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm accidentally excluding. I think a written submission makes the point that when we're, talk we're using MSPs as a shorthand, I sh what I should have said was decision makers. I asked the question uh, previously about other jurisdictions. Mr. Kelly's already uh, mentioned as well. You know, what are the other members' idea with uh, what can we learn from? Uh, previously, Canada was put up as a best practice by some other uh, evidence uh, that was being submitted, and uh, Washington there was things to learn there. But uh, and I'll be a wee bit more can uh, less candid in my comments. When I paraphrase what the other individual said about the UK uh, legislation, they said it was less robust. Than, uh, than what they wasn't what they were really looking for. So, what is there to learn anywhere else? Are you aware of anything? One example I asked a few colleagues round about um, the UK, you know, how they were dealing with this, because the jurisdictional point is an interesting one, particularly for those of us who operate in organisations that uh, will deal with local government, Holyrood, Westminster, um, and, and and Brussels. Um, one example which came out um, was, I think it was in May last year, the Welsh Assembly said that it would maintain some sort of watching brief on it. And I think they're going to look at some sort of voluntary um, code of conduct. Now, I don't, I don't have the details here. I could certainly you know, explore that. But when I spoke to my colleagues um, in Wales and said, look, what, what is this? What are the practical effects of this? What is this actually doing? Is it having any effect on your activities? Or is it, you know, are the members worried about it? And they said, no, no, it's fine. And the, the assembly there seems to be happy enough with that as a first step. I think rather like the Scottish Parliament, the Welsh Assembly hasn't had, as far as I'm aware, any significant a uh, lobbying scandal or you know, so-called lobbying um, scandal. So we could perhaps learn from um, how they've uh, managed to approach it. An offer to provide the committee with something, Mr Borrell? Certainly, if that would be helpful. Uh, to always help. Yeah. Uh, I, I do beg your pardon, I've just been told we've got it anyway. All right. So uh, that relieves you of that particular <laughs> task. Can I just um, add, add points by way of um, sort of comparison, um, in, comparisons internationally? I think, yeah, obviously, 
um, it, it, it's, a, um, it's a vitally important thing to do to look at other examples of, of functioning lobbying registers. Um, and we've, we've sort of looked at a, at, at a couple. Um, what you've got to remember is that, that all of these, these um, systems have, have sort of different cultures and different practices anyway. Um, I think what we would come back to is, um, is that we are looking at this at, a, at, a, at both a UK level and a, and, a, and a Scotland level at the moment. There are principles that, um, that both, again, the Scottish Government and the UK Government have set out in terms of better regulation, and, and they are the principles that, that, um, that, that we follow in these jurisdictions, and we should look at certainly um, the issues around proportionality and whether a new regulation is targeted before bringing forward something that is, um, that is uh, new and a, and a fresh regulatory burden in, the, in, in this jurisdiction. So can I just make a comment in, in, in terms of my, my earlier comment about the, 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 the learning we could have from the, the, the UK bill is, is um, how not to do it. Um, the, the feedback that I've had um, is, is around the, the speed with which the bill has dismissed the detail around thresholds and structures, etc., and gotten very quickly to language around compliance, around um, penalties, around um, uh, offences, etc. So, so there's a again this comment that you heard earlier on in your, your evidence session about this being a pejorative process, about lobbying being seen as something which is actually underhand and done in a clandestine way that requires the legislation to look at offences and penalties, etc. is something that's seen as, as um, um, probably over overburdened or overhanded. Can Can I just be clear, Mr. Kelly? Are you suggesting, and you may not have considered it at this level, that um, if a bill were to proceed, that details such as levels at which people will be caught and what the reporting detail might be something that would be covered in subsequent secondary legislation and subject to change as circumstances change? In other words, that the bill enabled that and it was dealt with out with that. Is that the suggestion of the sequencing that you would see as useful? And I, I think all of these things are temporal because the circumstances change, um, our economic circumstances change, there are a whole range of things that happen within the political um, arena that will change. I think legislation has to be fit for purpose, it has to be flexible, and it has to be able to be adapted as, as our circumstances change. Um, as I say, the, the sort of feedback that I've had anecdotally and informally is around the fact that there's a, a relatively small amount of detail around the register, how it would be managed, how it would be um, regulated, etc., but very, very heavy on um, some of the things that will happen if you fall foul of the register. Uh, right. I think Cameron wants to ask some questions on detail. Yes, I do. On detail. Uh, we've asked before, how do you all feel that the word lobbyist should be defined? And also, do you think that it's going to... Um, affect the openness and accountability of the Parliament if it is defined rather strictly? I think that's absolutely the crucial question um, because we have looked at this. We're not experts on the lobbying industry, but we do spend a lot of time looking at regulation and better regulation. The definition, Fraser made the point there, you know, about, um, about certainty, absolutely crucial. The biggest difficulty that our members experience in regulatory compliance is around trying to work out which regulations apply to them before they even get down, you know, before they've even began to fill, to fill a form in. It's very important, crucial, that people know exactly um, to whom that this a, such a register would apply. Now, there are some cases I would argue that you might think would be black and white. You know, you wouldn't want um, a constituency who goes to church on a Sunday morning is given a postcard to sign by the minister about a particular piece of policy and hands that in. You know, I don't imagine that would be Parliament's intention. Equally, the Director of Corporate Affairs for you know, a large lobbying uh, organisation probably would. How do you define that in, ma in language that is sufficiently clear to render it suitable for statutory regulation? Because I've heard people talk about time limits and time thresholds. I mean, someone like me, I maybe spend you know maybe a couple of hours a week, maybe maximum on actual lobbying, so it wouldn't cross anything like a sort of a, a threshold. Um, would it be rely on whether or not someone was employed or not? Well, organisations like ours have lay members who may receive a small honour area from the organisation for doing bits and pieces for us, whose part of the job will be to go and build good relationships with the local elected representatives and uh, advance FSB policy. So. How would you include them or would you not include them? What about people who were, for example, local small businessmen or small businesswomen 
who happens to be an office holder in a business organisation um, is going along to talk to, to you know, a, a, a local elected representative or official from uh, the local authority about an issue relating directly to their business and then begins to talk about something else that the FSB may be arguing with or without our knowledge. Quite how you can arrive at a definition which would include all the people you want to include and exclude all those you think should exclude and make that sufficiently clear to be robust enough to meet the principles of better regulation we think is very, very difficult, which is why we think it's a far easier and neater solution to record particular meetings where the, where the context is everything. I'd like to just ex extend that point, if I, I may, a little bit, because um, I think that it, it sort of this, um, to our mind, gets right to the heart of the issue around in-house teams. Um, they, they're um, clearly, um, uh, uh, we can um, come to our own definitions about what, what lobbying actually is, but then you need to look at, um, as Colin says, the practicality of, of how you would imp implement a register and who would be on it. We think there's a, there is a, a, a particular um, uh, particularly unique challenge for, for a, an in-house team, for example, um, in, in terms of judging who within an individual business would be registered. Um, would it be the chief executive who might have incidental contact with, um, with uh, uh, individuals in, in, in politics or, or, or the civil service? Would it be um, the public affairs team that you would register? Would it be technical experts who might engage on specific issues with, with civil servants um, on an ad hoc basis or on a on a particular project, you very quickly get into um, then having to, to set up systems within businesses for uh, for tracking all of this engagement, for making a judgment as to who, who might pass a threshold. And that it's that compliance burden that we're seeking to stress to you today and, um, and, and hoping that we can sort of consider as we kind of work towards um, some kind of register that might, uh, not, that might uh, be implemented without having a huge regulatory burden. I suppose your starting point should be that everyone is in, um, and rather than say who is excluded. Um, our, our position is, is, is strange, and it probably sits similarly to Collins, um, that we are a membership organisation. If we are creating the circumstances or the opportunity for our members to engage with MSPs, are we the regulatory, or we are the, the, the registered body, or is it the organisation who then has contact with the MSP? So there, there's a, an issue about... Um, who is actually the organisation that is registered, because we will always create opportunities for our members to, to meet with MSPs. We don't know what they engage with them on, on a specific um, commentary, um, but we, we do create that opportunity. We're also in the process where we are invited into consultations on a regular basis, um, and we're happy in those consultations to be representing the interests of our members. But again, is it we who are actually the, the, the registered body, or is it the, the organisation we are representing? Very much, Kavina. Uh, thank you, Cameron. Fiona. Um, if, if we do go down the route of having a register, um, I'd look, like to look at some of the practicalities and get your thoughts on it. Um, there's, there's been various suggestions about who should administer a register if we set one up. Um, Scottish Information Commissioner, Commissioner on Ethics and Standards in Public Life, the Parliament, perhaps through this committee, or a whole new organisation. Thoughts on that? And whether there should be a fee for registering, and how that fee should be set. And also, one of the things that you know, I'm sort of quite keen on, that if we are registering, then how do we monitor the compliance of the registration, and should there be sanctions if anyone doesn't maintain um, the ethics of that register? Me to go first again. I think yeah, if if you go down the route that we are suggesting, then you know, we think that it is a fairly new, uh, you know, fairly neat, almost cost neutral a uh, solution to look at enhancing the MSP's code of conduct and making it responsible for members or indeed officials or others who the uh, Parliament deems should be you know should be included who are sufficiently important decision makers for that to be lobbied. Um, that would. You know, um, negate the need to have an extra body created, which also comes with extra costs and is extra administration and, uh, and all that, and would also uh, you know, mean we could bypass questions about who would actually fund it because we could probably meet it within existing uh, you know, sort of ad administrative budgets. Um, we've not taken a view on which organisation specifically should 
house a register if one's brought forward. Clearly, um, we our starting point is, is actually we, we, we don't believe that a, a, a sufficient case has been put forward for a register being created in the in, in the first place. But um, what we said, um, we were sort of working within the um, the reality of the fact that one might be brought forward, was that um, was that any register that was created would, would need to be independent from um, from government, from parliament, and from the from the industry itself. So in that respect, we, we would we would suggest looking at, um, at, at organisations that, that fit that bill um, and uh, and uh, e even um, that can, can can work this in without having to create a completely new organisation at additional cost. Similarly, would um, not be able to, to advise you on who should uh, be the, the host of the register, um, but would certainly caution against creating any new bodies. I think we're, um, we're new bodied out at the moment um, in terms of our relationships with, with government um, and with parliament. Um, a fee structure, uh, huge concerns over a fee. Um, fees um, get to the stage where they who can pay most get to say most and uh, shout loudest. Um, sanctions, you know, my, my earlier comments um, were about the language of, of the, the, the bill that is going through Westminster at the moment. Um, inevitably, if you create a register and you create a set of circumstances where there is an expected behaviour, then you have to have some way of regulating the behaviour if, it, if it, it, it becomes inappropriate. So sanctions, yes, if you go down the route of creating a register. Um, fee, no. And who administers? I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to, to give you advice on, on who should take that responsibility at the moment. Uh, Richard? Thank you, Kuhn. Uh, convener, uh, this question actually has been partly answered, but um, if there was a, a register, should there be a threshold for registration and what exemptions should there be uh, from the register? I think that's explained in my answer to Mr Buchanan. I think that's absolutely the nub of the issue. How do you define that threshold? You know, it's obvious, and you know, you know who we want to get and who you don't. How do you define that correctly? I don't think you can do it easily with time. I don't think you can do it with um, money spent either, because of the questions that Richard raised about um, in-house staff and how you, you know, um, allocate that. So very tricky, and we don't have an easy answer to that one, I'm afraid. Uh, I, I would sort of extend the point I made, made earlier. Um, we um, we take taking the view that, uh, that that if there was to be a register, then um, it would be a proportionate response would be to draw it fairly fairly narrow, narrowly. Um, so um, that might include um, third party lobbying consultancies, for example, where there is um, an issue around um, whether it is clear um, on on whose behalf um, those interactions um, are, are, are taking place or not. So so there's an issue around sort of third party representatives. Um, we um, we are clear that, that because of the practical um, difficulties that, that I've described earlier on, on in-house teams, that that, that that would be, certainly be more of an issue, and we would argue for them not to be covered. I think when you get to, to start to consider whether a register is valid and the thresholds, etc., I think you get into the territory where, at the moment, um, consultations through Parliament are actually very open and transparent, I think. I, I think it, it works very, very well at the moment. As soon as you start to create a register with various thresholds, whether that be on the amount of money spent on lobbying, the turnover of an organisation, it's um, capital expenditure, it's staff, how do, you, how do you justify what the thresholds are on any register? When you then begin to go through the consultation process, how do you select the people whom you most think, or you think, will most effectively influence and, and give best evidence to your consultations? And do you pick three from the top of the list, two from the middle part of the list, three from the bottom. I think you get into territory where if you start to put a register together, then you apply thresholds. Um, you have to be very, very clear about what you want to achieve in terms of the use of the register and the use of lobbyists and influencers to make sure that your policies and your procedures and your legislation is as effective as it possibly can be. Um, I'm sure if you go down the route of a register and you start to be selective, the first thing that will happen is that someone will take you to task on whether you, why you have taken one organisation at the expense of another organisation and whether that is fair and reasonable. I, I made a point, yeah. The other uh, 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 witnesses that um, being on a a particular committee, you can be seen. People may believe you're you're more powerful powerful than what you really are. Um, but basically, you may have one company because of the number of bills that have, have come in front of that committee. One company may come in and see you twenty odd times, and rather than your other colleagues only come in and see them once. 
uh, would that drive MSPs to say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want to see it? Your, your processes are open and transparent. Um, I don't think there's any set of circumstances where um, an MSP would want not to see an organisation if it was able to inform their decision making and their understanding of a set of circumstances. Um, I don't think that's territory that you would get into um, because I do think the systems and procedures that are available at the moment out with the fact that we don't have a register just now are actually very transparent and very strong. to ask anything more on uh, MSP diaries being published? Uh, well, I already <coughs> asked the question there earlier on. Can, right, you, if, if you're can I ask something else? Just of course. Some, uh, Mr Kelly uh, mentioned there about the idea if we had an a actual list of uh, lobbyists uh, that it would be a case of who do you bring to bring evidence kind of thing. But, you know, the Parliament's open and transparent as it is. Imagine I'm a clerk and I've got five evidence sessions coming up. You know, there could be arguments made at the moment that a lot of uh, uh, the same faces and same groups actually attend a lot of the, uh, the, the committee hearings or uh, inquiries and things like that at the moment. So that argument could be made now. Would it not be more open and transparent if you actually had this list of groups that are there and everybody in the public could actually see that these are people who are coming back and forward and engaging with the parliamentary process? I think that, that, that's fair comment, but um, as I mentioned earlier on, I think that all of our, our activity, um, irrespective of whether it's from the side of the, the Parliament or it's the side of, of the organisations who are petitioning to you, that that should be as open and transparent as possible. That my, my comments are, are made on the basis that you need to get the best information that you possibly can to be able to inform your decision-making process. Um, recently, there, there's been work done, and, and um, I think the MSPs have, have, have identified the fact that they do get a breadth of information and a quality of information by going to intermediary organisations who are representative in membership bodies that will give you um, feedback on issues of um, geographical uh, content. They will be about in, um, business scale, size, scope, business structure, etc. So I think as soon as you start to put a register together, you do come back to that position where you will select someone that may exclude someone else who has a slightly different view. So I, I think at the moment the processes are open enough. Um, I, I wouldn't see that a register would add to that. My argument, as already, I've already stated, would be the fact that, you know, we, we have that process just now, you know, and uh, that could be an accusation that's made by other groups that why didn't we get uh, to... I'm in education. Children and young people's bills just going through to stage three in the next couple of weeks. Someone saying, well, we never managed to get evidence in that session. How could we not get in it? We're a children's charity. You know, that could be an accusation at the moment, but if you look at a list of all these groups that are available there, you know, you, you know who's involved. You know, it would maybe make some of the clerks' work a lot easier to see who's actually there to actually get an evidence session together. Just a point on that, I mean, I think that's, um, I think that's, you know, a fair point and picking up what Mr Lyle was saying as well about you know the 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 the, the unintended negative perceptions of the, that could arise from publishing diaries or indeed lists of uh, consultees. But I suppose you know you make the point as well that you know there is a fair amount of the, the, the usual suspects and if it was making people actually go a little bit wider and try, you know, a uh, to you know to get as many views as possible, which this plays and does, and I know I'm, I pay tribute to the clerks because they do a lot of, they don't simply ask us in to give evidence, they'll say, well, can we maybe have a selection of your members? And if they don't want to come to a formal committee meeting, uh, would you like to have um, a round table with us so we can find out how some of these uh, you know, legislative changes may operate on the ground, or you can maybe explain a particular problem that we're, that we're looking at? I think all of that is perfectly le legitimate, and... It would take, you know, and people may try and spin it against you. Well, wait a minute, you've met this organisation so many times and now look at all these amendments that have gone down as a result. Um, at stage two, isn't there some sort of conspiracy here? But at the end of the day, I suppose we're professional communicators and we have to make that point and say, well, yes, you know, <laughs> they brought me a compelling case and, uh, and, and therefore we acted on it. That sounds like it's democracy in action rather than anything more sinister. I wonder if the, the, the members of the panel might care to comment on perhaps an area I've got some difficulty with, which is knowing who I'm speaking to. And I don't mean Colin Borland. That's the name of the individual. But 
who they are in terms of who they're representing. Because, for example, in the Federation of Small Businesses, one might, in Scotland, look at the, the chair who might be speaking on behalf of the organisation. He is a business person who might properly speak on behalf of his organisation. And he also is a resident of the North East of Scotland and he might have personal issues. Is there a need for greater clarity as to what hats people are wearing, perhaps, when they're engaging with uh, public decision makers? I think it's possibly, although I haven't seen any evidence of that creating a problem yet. You're right that, you know, our chair, who's a, you know, a, from your part of the world, may be coming to speak to you about something that particularly relates um, to an issue he's, in, he's involved with or something that may be just very specific to his own business. And then we'll say, incidentally, you know about the following things which are happening. That would be entirely natural. I would expect that to happen. I don't see that that's a major issue. But if it did turn into a situation where somebody wanted to come along and speak to you as a constituent, and it turns out what they're actually doing is sitting reading from a policy document, then you think... That's the point where you would say, right, I need to record this because that part of the meeting was me being lobbied by an outside organisation. Beyond that, um, I, know, I think that would, again, would be a fairly straightforward way to address that. Just for clarity, I wasn't picking on any individual. No, but it, but Merely it's using a good an example. example. The FSB is a good example. So I don't, yeah, no. yeah, yeah. Anyone else? Want? Similarly, yes, I, I think Social Enterprise Scotland is a good example because we have uh, membership um, open to associate members. So we have people like Pricewaterhouse and Coopers, Royal Bank of Scotland, etc., as our members. Uh, uh, sorry, as associate members, we represent the interests of our members. We are not in our policy campaigning representing RBS and PWC in, in that context. So I think it is important that you understand who we are as representative bodies, who our membership is and, and what our construct is. And where we're, we're quite um, careful around that is in the, the, the construction of our memorandum and articles, who can be members, what the distinction of those membership categories are, um, to make sure that we are representing the interests of the people that um, fit with our membership criteria on social enterprise. Yeah, I think I echo a lot of what the, the other panellists have said. I think the um, CBI and CBI Scotland are in a, in a similar position. Um, I think that uh, certainly um, with respect to um, uh, individuals that sit on our, um, our decision-making committees, our, our chairman, um, both at, at UK level and in, in Scotland, um, often these people may wear um, different hats in their day-to-day um, -day working life. I actually think that um, one... Um, effective way to um, to perhaps add a bit more transparency around that could be to come back to the details that are published about um, about meetings that that take place um, I know that that certainly um, with the with the UK government there's a varying degree of, of information that, that that is put out about topics of, of discussion at meetings um, I think that's something that that could be looked at um, in uh, uh, in Scotland as well as I know that the topics of discussion aren't necessarily published in terms of ministers meetings and that, um, that all of that kind of information helps us to get to a, a, a fuller picture of, of the issues that are that are being covered. Uh, we don't appear to have any further questions. So, if uh, members wish to provide a hundred words summing up or uh, draw our attention to anything we haven't otherwise covered, and that's about one minute. Top whack, Fraser. <coughs> I come back to my, my, my original statement. It's about lobbying and campaigning. It's a good thing. Um, we should be encouraging as many people as we possibly can to do it. I think the systems and procedures that exist at the moment are, are robust. Um, I'm, I'm hugely encouraged by the connection that we have with Parliament in all its guises um, on behalf of our members. So, um, whilst we respect your, your views to, to look at registration um, and will abide by any decision that you make on that, um, we think the processes and procedures that you have at the moment are actually very effective for the, the membership of our organisation. Colin? Yes, uh, we, don't, we haven't seen the evidence that the case has been made for imposing additional statutory regulatory burdens. Um, however, should the um, Committee in Parliament take the current review, we don't believe that having a register of lobbyists would be the simplest and most effective way to do it. Indeed, when we look at who should be captured and shouldn't be captured, arriving at a definition which would be sufficiently clear and robust to meet the requirements of better regulation is difficult to the point of impossibility in our view. Therefore, we think a far neater and easier way uh, and more cost-effective way is to uh, 
place that responsibility on those who are being lobbied to record meetings which they think, a, in their view, um, someone is trying to push a, or advocate a particular policy or line. Uh, just for clarity. Poor than publish? Yes. Yes. And, it, and that would include officials? Yes. Right. Uh, we're clear that lobbying is obviously an absolutely essential part of the, of the public policy making process. Um, and uh, therefore it's right and proper to look at, at, at transparency. Uh, the question then becomes how you deliver that transparency. There are a range of, of, uh, of measures that already exist, be that through, um, through the MSP's code, through publication of meetings, freedom of information, as well as other things. Um, and uh, with that all in mind, and, and with the fact that we've not seen uh, any, any evidence of, of, of wrongdoing in Scotland, we would argue that a register is not a proportionate response and not in line with um, the Scottish Government's own better regulation agenda. Right, thank you very much for attending and for your input. Uh, once again, if we have any further issues we think we want to raise with you, I hope you'll respond positively if we ask for that information. Thank you. I'm seeing the nodding heads. I now move this uh, meeting into private session.